They hate. They hate. They hate. They hate. They, they hate because they fear. They hate because they fear. Because they fear. Because they fear. And they fear because they feel that the deepest feelings of their lives are being assaulted and outraged. They do not know why. They are powerless pawns. Powerless pawns. They are powerless pawns in, in a, a blind. blind play of social forces. Richard, Richard Wright. Wright. Andy's exit was inevitable. As inevitable as her death. Before she left, walked out sometime during the day while I was at work, she had had a hard time finding her way from the bedroom to the kitchen. Or maybe she'd begun to walk down the hall and forgot where she was. Maybe she thought she was in Errol's apartment. I had to follow her everywhere, just in case she was asleep. Andy was never asleep. Andy was always asleep. From Mauhaus Productions, A Blind Play of Social Forces, Season 2, Episode 12, Left and Leaving. I follow Andy everywhere. Miss Adventure. (laughs) We've been dating a month. I suggest a movie. She says a hike in the Appalachians. (laughs) Miss Adventure. We get turned around, but instead of going back down the same trail we came in on, we trek into the next valley. Andy wants to... Keep going, just to see. (sighs) So, which way? Mm. This way. She confidently points down a trail that doesn't look like a trail. Definitely this way. I recognize that tree. It starts to rain. Not a drenching rain, but one of those smoky mountain rains where the air is thick with water vapor. So cold. So lost. It's just up ahead. (laughs) She bounces like a cheerleader. We, We should have gone the other way. Don't be a little Miss Poopy Pants. She boops me on my frozen, wet nose. It's just up ahead. The parking lot is not just up ahead, and I am scared, but Andy just takes a survey of our surroundings, collects some fallen branches, and goes to work building a lean-to, a lush tent of evergreens. I pretend I can help. She scoots inside, feet first, and before her head disappears, she asks, Are you coming to cuddle me or what? Petite Andy. I am able to zip us both into my coat. (sighs) The next morning, Andy leads us right back to my car. The hike takes less than an hour. The contents of my trunk and glove box are strewn across the gravel parking lot. She'd left the door open. (music) 
The neurologist suggested, Can you leave your door open? Just leave it open. At first, I had just left it unlocked, even though she had a key, but I considered that maybe if faced with a closed door, she might turn back around. I knew it was ridiculous. She, she wasn't a dog. I get her a necklace for her birthday. It looks like a dog tag. It's sweet, but I like to buy my own jewelry. <laughs> I'm picky. She kisses me on the nose. The necklace goes right into her jewelry box. So does the bracelet I buy after I see her eyeing it at an antique store. I don't say anything. It's better sometimes to stay quiet with Andy. The neighborhood is quiet. Um, it was well, quiet as Brooklyn can get, but... I knew I was taking a risk by leaving the door open. I never locked the door back home. I asked my neighbors, uh, the ones I saw anyway, to keep an eye out, but most of them work days like me. A fourth floor walk-up. To rob the place, you'd have to know the door was open and no one was home. I came home from work, and I just knew something was missing. Like, you know when someone is looking at you? That feeling. I went right to her jewelry box, or rather the place where her jewelry box had been. On her dresser, a silver triangle. A memento from a race. I'm waiting at the finish line, holding the thermal blanket I'm supposed to wrap around her when she finishes. The New York City Marathon, the first after 9-11, and her first ever. She's an athlete to end Alzheimer's. She doesn't know yet that's not what her mother suffered from. She wants to run one marathon a year, every year of her 30s. I see her. She's hobbling, but determined. An old man, maybe even in his 80s, passes her. I hold up my sign. Run, Andy, run. <laughs> she crosses the line, and I'm there, and I hold her, and she's breathing hard. <laughs> I want to live here. At the finish line? Marry me, and move to New York. I can get actual acting jobs, and, and, and not just car commercials. She is stumbling <laughs> like a drunk. Maybe you should have a banana. Just kiss me and say yes. Mm. <laughs> yes. I explained to Ross at work. Open. Not just unlocked? Open? That's what the doctor said to do. What, so he can rob the place? What'd the police say? I haven't called the police yet. Why hadn't I called the police? Maybe put up a sign that says, like, super working in apartment, or the door is broken but my gun isn't. I should call the police. Are there always police sirens? I ask Andy as we unpack. I think it's comforting. We need to find a weed dealer. We aren't married, but we are in New York, and we may as well be lost in the woods. This apartment is huge. My childhood bedroom was bigger. We really need to find a weed dealer, Miss Poopy Pants. Dance with me. Andy is like a drug that makes me feel miserable and invigorated at the same time. A note card at the top of a box of books. Happy Andyversary. I'm just not a dancer.
I tacked a note to the door. Superintendent working in apartment. Do not close door. Anyone seeing the note would think twice before entering. They wouldn't rob a place with the super around, and, and the door would still be open for Andy. I didn't notice the books were gone. Andy was the reader. I was vacuuming, and, and when I bumped the bookshelf, no books fell. I shut off the vacuum and heard a woman coughing. Andy. There was no one in the hall, but... There was a book about halfway between our place and the stairs. Respect for Acting by Uta Hagen We're sitting up in bed in our apartment that's a quarter the size and four times the rent of my place in Louisville. I have a magazine, Time, or Newsweek, some article about the Bush White House. She's reading a play. Let's go out. We can't afford it. Then read to me. Uh, I'm tired. I'm going to explore. You, you can't go by yourself. Why? Muggings? Rapes? Murders? And that's just on the first date. Come on, Miss Poopy. Ah, oh, I hate that name. Andy never seems tired. Weekends were the worst. Exhausting. Sundays were poster days. The print shop first... And then around Brooklyn, tacking posters over flyers for bands and yoga studios and Reiki healing. Have you seen me? They say. My name is Andy. I suffer from dementia. If you see me, please call my husband Michael at 859-361-08. Did you change your phone number? We're New Yorkers now. We should have New York numbers. <laughs> Errol says... Errol? What, as in... Errol? The guy down the hall. British. Actor. You met him. I think I'd remember meeting an Errol. <laughs> the Cutlass and Tricorn alone. Errol says... I'll get more callbacks with the local number. Our new neighbor. Errol... Mr. Off-Broadway. I changed the sign on the door a few times. Back in five minutes became across the hall, became do not enter, became please do not enter, became my wife suffers from dementia. She has wandered off. I have to keep the door open in case she returns. Please do not enter my apartment. I beg you. Within a week, I was eating takeout. Can't cook without pans. Can't eat without dishes and silverware. I spilled duck sauce on Andy's ratty, reclaimed chair. I get up late on Sundays, and when I shuffle into the living room, she's curled up in what she calls her dumpster chair, reading a play by someone named Fugard. A brushstroke of cream cheese spans the arm of the chair. Good book? I couldn't sleep. Errol brought bagels. Errol is absent, but Andy is wearing a new necklace. Huh. A simple gold chain. New necklace? She straightens it. Uta Hagen wore it. And who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? Is that before she started making ice cream? Andy ignores me. Where'd you get it? She looks up at me. Her eyes ringed red and sunken. Can you make coffee? Pretty please. I think both my legs are asleep. Oh, 
my coffee maker gone, I started getting coffee at the deli around the corner. Someone had tacked over one of my Andy flyers. I watched as one of my neighbors tore the offending poster down. Poor Andy. She sat down opposite me. Mm, I'm so sorry. She'll come home. My neighbor took my hand. I couldn't remember her name. I thought she was home yesterday. Well, you saw her? It wasn't her. She squeezed my hand. You know what? Personally, I think it was a realtor in that British Briggs apartment. Errol's apartment is exactly like ours, only it seems larger. He calls himself a minimalist. He has invited us over for cocktails and amuse-bouche. Andy is telling her version of the hiking story. <laughs> and Michael is wetting himself, convinced we are going to die in the wilderness. Mm, I wasn't wetting myself. I mumble into my tumbler. Errol does make a strong drink. But... We survived. I wasn't wetting myself. And this one left the car door open. Andy points to herself. <laughs> what on earth? Errol sounds like a wildlife video voiceover. I was out of my mind on mushrooms. <laughs> Andy drains a bottle of scotch into her glass. But you didn't... Oh, psychedelics. And now he sounds like Bowie. I stupidly confront her about it. You didn't tell me that. You always freak out about that kind of stuff. Wh what if you had OD'd? See? She wears the look of a teenager talking about her dad. She leans in to Errol and touches his hand. Well, I see we need some more spirits, sir. <laughs> and when I return, we talk about Broadway stars with herpes. I had gone to the police, and they had told me exactly what I expected. If you really think she's missing, missing, put up posters. Like a missing dog? Yeah. She'll probably get embarrassed and tell you to take them down. Andy didn't get embarrassed. Unless she's in London with, um... She scanned her notes. Errol. Like Errol Flynn. Andy had found a new home. Andy's not home. It's 1 a.m., Sunday morning. I'm eating cold noodles and ice cream. She has gone out with friends, and I don't have her new number programmed into my phone. Errol says she's a New Yorker now. I walk down the hall to Errol's apartment. I can smell her perfume before he opens the door. Oh. Alvin Cena. She went out uh, with theater friends, I say trying to stay in his doorway as long as possible. I thought maybe she might have, uh... I saw her earlier. Where? This is just, uh, enjoying herself, mate. A record scratch from inside his apartment. Errol shrugs. I thought the stereo would go first, but it took two weeks before it went missing. And all the records... I went back to the police. People are robbing my apartment? Add more locks. You find your wife yet? Maybe they were looking. I tell her no. Metal door frame. Look into it. She's not in love with me anymore. She loves me, but she's not in love with me. She wants to be, she says. It's not me, it's her. New York has changed her, opened her up. I'm still in Kentucky, she says. I'm right here, I tell her. I, I suggest counseling. I don't mention Errol. She's trembling. Are you okay? It's nothing. She turns. Her shoulder blades protrude. She's having trouble holding her head up. 
She pulls a blanket from the closet. I ask her what she's doing. I can't sleep in that bed anymore. I don't think it likes me. You can't sleep anymore. The bedding had been stolen, but not the mattress and box springs. I asked my neighbors if they had seen anything. People coming and going from the building. Nothing. No one sneaking out with a bag of linens. No one with a box of records. No one with books, picture frames, that god-awful painting Errol had given us on our anniversary. Oh, it's just beautiful. Errol's anniversary gift is the only one we receive even from each other. I buy Andy a gift, a sash that reads, Miss Adventure. But I, I, I can't give it to her. Oh, what is it? Michael, what a question. Andy is embarrassed by her platonic roommate. It's two lovers. It's paint smears. Andy hangs it on the wall opposite our bed that isn't really our bed anymore since she started sleeping on the sofa. I like the way it moves. Like they're dancing. I think she is using her imagination. She isn't. When Errol leaves, I ask Andy why she wants the painting in a room she doesn't sleep in. I'll look at it while you're sleeping. After a month, after coming home to an apartment furnished with a chair and a naked queen-sized bed, I closed the door on my way out to work. It's not that I wanted to protect what remained in that lonely apartment. I just knew that it didn't matter anymore. I had stopped imagining her return. I had created this absurd story of a lost love returning home, and the universe had added its own supernatural absurdity, the invisible thief. The police told me that it was more than likely that Andy had taken off with Errol to London. I told them that was impossible. TV cops said that maybe she was dead. We see it with Alzheimer's. They fall into the river, they walk into the wrong neighborhood. What does she have? Fatal, familial... Just 35, you say? Insomnia. Huh. Rare? She's more interested in Andy's fascinating condition than her disappearance. It's so rare. The neurologist says this with a childlike glee. He says Andy will eventually need a full-time caregiver. He looks at me. I don't tell him that Andy only lives with me because she can't afford to move out. I want to ask him if the disease can make someone fall out of love. Fatal. Fate. Destined. Doomed. He prescribes sleeping pills and tells us he's not sure if they'll work. On the train ride home, Andy looks at me and says, Errol. Michael. I can't do this anymore. You said that two months ago. I don't want to waste any of the life I have left living a lie. I think I'm in love with Errol. Then you should move in with Errol. Oh, it's not that simple. She says this to the man who just paid a fortune for doctor's appointments and a useless prescription. Yeah, it is. You take that ratty chair and the finger painting and you walk a hundred feet into your new life. Andy isn't paying attention to me, though. Remember the other day when we were hiking? I was lost.
I had to pass Errol's apartment every day. Twice a day, at least. Each time I saluted that door with my middle finger, even after Errol had moved out. My finger was still pointing skyward when I saw that my door was open. I had been shutting it, locking it even, but there it was, wide open. Andy's chair was gone. My toothbrush and shampoo were gone. The bed remained. Walking from the train to our apartment, Andy tells me I should move back to Kentucky, that maybe she will move in with Errol. Errol has other plans. London. One year. He leaves a note. A. Opportunity knocks. See you on our return, XOXO. E. He didn't tell me he was leaving. The super tells me everything's going in storage, says Errol does this all the time. I don't know what's real. Andy's vacant eyes look bruised. If she had been killed, hit by a car or, or shot or something, I could have grieved and moved on. If she had left me for Errol, I, I probably would have moved out and moved on. Not immediately, but eventually. After coming home to an empty apartment with my duffel bag and Chinese takeout for weeks, I said goodbye to Andy. I ordered new furniture, new dishes, new everything from Ikea, Andy's credit card. Andy hated Ikea. Andy is sitting in her chair, digging her fingernails into the stuffing billowing from the torn arms. Her feet are propped on a stack of magazines and catalogs. The Ikea catalog is on top. Living small in New York. One of her eyes is closed. I ask her if she's having a stroke. I'm half sleeping. I dreamed I was alive. You are alive. I recognize that tree. I want to keep going just to see. Keep going with me? Do I love you? I got a call from a guy who runs the bodega at the end of the block. Serge, or, or Sergey, uh, told me he had seen Andy in his shop. And you're sure it's her? I think so. Or maybe her mother. He would have known. Andy bought her not-so-secret cigarettes from him. I ran down the block to the shop. Serge or Sergey tells me the woman had paid cash for groceries. She had not bought cigarettes. She left one of her bags sitting on the sidewalk. He lifted a bag from behind the counter. Two cans of fruit cocktail. What, did you see which way she went? He nodded in the direction of our apartment. Mike. She looked like she had gotten to some nasty shit. She picks out the cherries, but still only drinks the juice. Andy is aging quickly. Her hair is graying, her fingers like claws gripping the can. She's in a state of continuous sleepwalking, her droopy-eyed somnambulations broken by mere minutes of sleep. She stares at Errol's painting, tugging on her necklace. Where does the music come from? 
there there is no music. And what are they dancing to? In two days, she'll be gone. When I was very young, I came face to face with a raccoon. I had been taking out the garbage and there it was, perched on an overturned bin. That face. That surprised and proudly guilty face. That that was Andy's face when I ran into her in the hall. She was fumbling in her purse with her claw-like maladroit hand, this haggard woman with streaks of gray and an odor of urine. I knew it was Andy before I knew it was Andy. She looked at me quizzically, and she looked at Errol's door and back to me. As if directed to do so, she, she dropped her purse, staggered to me, and flung her arms around my neck. Errol... She gripped me tightly. Her breath was hot and pungent. She pulled away and focused on the door. She had to concentrate to get the key into the lock, and she seemed so proud of her success. I half expected Errol himself to be standing in the kitchen sipping tea and making dinner. And there was no Errol, though. My sofa... My bookshelf, my stereo and records, my photos, but no Errol. Where have you been? Been looking for you for weeks. I'd been home, silly. Her lips and tongue vaguely moved. She folded herself into her chair and picked up a script from an end table my mother had given me. She squinted at the pages and then thrust the book in my direction. Read to me, Errol. It slipped from her hand. In the corner of the room, a lean-to made of chairs and blankets. A pair of hiking boots parked at the entrance. I try to keep her in the apartment, but she says it feels like the walls are closing in. I know it can eat me, but what if it can? I can't chain the door from the outside. I can't quit my job. I can't hire a full-time nurse. I'm going to work. I feel like a dad talking to his sick daughter who has to stay home from school. I I made you tea. When I return home, the door is open. Andy is gone. I made tea in Errol's kitchen. When I returned to his living room... Andy was tapping her feet and staring at a photo she had stolen from our apartment. Meryl, you look... She forgot the word. You're... Older? Not the same. We all get a little older. Not the same person. I'm a New Yorker, darling. I sat down on the floor in front of her. My emaciated former queen on her tattered throne. She was moving her mouth again as if to speak. It's unlikely she'll return. If she's hallucinating already, she's nearing the end. I want to hit him for being so callous. If and when she's lucid, she may seek out familiar places. Can you leave your door open? (music) 
I tipped the guys who delivered my Ikea shipment and locked the door on my way to Errol's. Inside, Andy's leaned to. I zipped us both up in my jacket. Left and Leaving was written and directed by me, Michael Mao, and stars Danny Gavigan as Michael, Neca as Andy, Regan Prum as Errol, Ryan Goffman as Ross, Elizabeth Laidlaw as Detective Graff, Juan Pablo Suarez as Serge, Tony Poe as the neighbor and featuring Alton Leonard as the neurologist the theme music was composed by Trevor Tremaine with additional music by Kevin McLeod and Alexi Chistilian Geneva Hicks created the podcast cover art additional sound effects courtesy of Pixabay writer, comedian and actor Nina Dicker helped produce this episode. Special thanks, as always, to assistant casting director Annie Weaver, who has been with me every step of the way. You can find out more about our cast and crew at ablindplaypodcast.com or on Instagram at Mauhouse Productions. I also want to thank Seed and Spark and all of the show's supporters for making Season 2 possible. I'll be dropping names all season, but today I want to thank Amanda Holt, Aaron May, Aaron Kerfoot, Faith Jennings, Tony Serechia, and Andy Hage, after whom Andy was named. Next week, on A Blind Play of Social Forces, Episode 13, This is Our North Dakota. You're my muse. Thank you. That song is a tough one for me. I used to love it, but now I'm not so sure. It's about someone who hurt me in all the ways that you expect someone would hurt you. You know, how songs and memories cling together like two wounded animals <laughs> clinging to each other, walking through the snow, bleeding. <laughs> Anyways, um, this next song is on my new album, and i uh, been having a booger of time finishing it. So, But here we are. Here we go. It's called Cliché. And one. Why don't you sing one of my songs, darling? You can hear more May 25th. If you aren't already, please follow the show. Your podcast app should have a follow button. Click it. And please rate and review. Ratings and reviews are the lifeblood of podcasts, and they take so little time. Just click those five stars. Tell us about your favorite episode. Share with friends and family. And thank you for listening.